So I think this is a really provocative rubric under which we've gathered and under which these discussions uh, are taking place. The notion of decolonizing knowledge, democratizing knowledge. It's uncomfortable and unsettling in a way um, talking about this within the academy because what it forces us to do is to acknowledge that this institution of which we are affiliated, not just Syracuse, but the university uh, writ large, um, has a colonizing impulse. That the university has some very undemocratic practices and undemocratic uh, history. This place where we do our work, forge partnerships, forge lifelong friendships, uh, etc., cetera, uh, has as its core some really fundamental contradictions. Now, this is not surprising to those of you who've sort of looked at the history of university. Uh, university began as a whites only colonial project, uh, literally in most cases built with slave labor and on stolen Indian land, and representing an ideological project that did not include women, people of color, propertyless men, or indigenous people. Quite to the contrary, uh, representing a privileged white gentleman's club that helped to dress up and justify the status quo. Now that was the foundation. But that's not the whole story and the university at its best is contested terrain. That is contrary to the notion of universities uh, and colleges as bastions of liberalism uh, and radicalism, colleges and universities have been sites for struggle. And within that struggle, there have been some profoundly conservative uh, tendencies and impulses. There has been resistance to change, inclusion, engagement, and some right, outright hostility to recognizing reservoirs of knowledge and sites of knowledge validation outside of our campuses. But the university is not stagnant. I'm a historian uh, by training, and so I understand there's constant change. Every institution, no matter how conservative it may appear to be on one level, is constantly in flux. Uh, and it is in periods of disruption, social upheaval, uh, that the university has been willing to, or forced to, uh, reassess itself. But I want to transition now to talk about what we might extract from this very long and rich political career. I think there are three aspects um, of Ella Baker's life's work that are really important as we grasp for a progressive vision of intellectual work in the 21st century, a vision that both decolonizes and democratizes. One is her notion of being an outsider within. The other is her commitment to looking at some of the most oppressed sectors of any community and giving priority to the voices of the most oppressed uh, as a critical barometer of how well one is doing social justice work. And thirdly, the importance of democratic intergenerational work and solidarity. So I want to come back uh, to all three of these. Let me say a little bit more about this notion of the outsider within. Uh, as I just said, you know, Ella Baker's work what, took her to many different places. She traveled throughout the South in very, very dangerous circumstances when she was a, a field organizer for the NACP. Uh, in fact, they would put up a flyer saying, Ella Baker is coming from New York City. Um, you know, we'll be speaking, here a fiery speaker, which she joked later was tantamount to putting a target on her back because, um, you know, the Ku Klux Klan was very active in the areas in which she was uh, organizing. Uh, nevertheless, she was uh, fearless and, and um, went into many of these contexts, uh, you know, knowing full well what the, what the dangers were. But Ella Baker's long experience as a grassroots organizer and the extensive network that she developed, particularly, particularly during her years uh, in Harlem and her years later uh, as an NACP uh, field worker, were critically valuable uh, to various movement organizations. She became the highest ranking woman in the NACP in the mid-40s, um, how she achieved that status is um, a little uh, curious and sometimes controversial. She said she was just sent a letter and told that she was now the director of branches and she accepted. Uh, other people said, well, you know, she was courted and consulted and so forth and so on. Uh, but she didn't aspire for these, these kinds of titles. Nevertheless, her experience um, and, and her savvy as an organizer 
led to her appointment and inclusion in many circles. But how she functioned with the national leadership of the NACP, for example, and how she functioned when she was the only woman, the only non-cleric in the circles of the Southern Christian Leadership Council in the 1950s is very, very important. That is, when she got to the table, she was not always polite at the table. Uh, she often joked that she was a difficult woman, and other people said she was too, and she was quite proud of that. Uh, she was the person who would speak up and question the leader who was presiding. Uh, she was the person who would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, we can't make this decision. So-and-so is not here. Have you heard from this person or that person? Or we need to postpone this decision until we can hear from this person or that person. So she was the kind of person who, once she got her foot in the door, uh, she didn't slip quietly in and slam the door behind her, but rather she wedged her foot in the door and tried to open it wider um, for other people.